workshop. It's a unique opportunity because in this forum we get to hear from faculty about how they write. The Berkeley linguist Robin Lakoff has said that, quote, language is the currency of the university. And in this forum today, we'll see how one faculty member crafts his language from drafting to revising. Today, we're honored to have as our guest, Professor Walter Alvarez. He's a professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Professor Alvarez is a native of Berkeley, and his father was a professor of physics here. Walter, however, went off to attend college at Carleton College, which is a long way from Berkeley in many, many different ways, and on to Princeton. He returned in um, 1977 to join the, um, de the Department of Geology, I think, at, the, at that point, and he's taught at Berkeley since then. Walter is one of those Berkeley faculty whose fame is really worldwide and who has had a significant role in changing how we think about geological processes. He's got numerous awards, honorary doctorates, and all sorts of medals, but I, I won't go into all of them today. It'll take me most of an hour if I were to do that. But let it, suffice it to say that he's, his colleagues know him best for his groundbreaking research and scientific articles, and the public know him best for his role in developing the theory that the, um, an asteroid hitting the Earth was what caused the extinction, extinction of the dinosaurs. <coughs> he has an um, accounting of that in a book he wrote, T-Rex and the Crater of Doom. And although today is about writing, I would be remiss in saying that Walter is also an absolutely excellent teacher. His class has been described as being like a symphony. Today, Walter will be interviewed by Michael Larkin of the College Writing Programs, who has published his stories and articles <coughs> in many different magazines and journals. Finally, I would like to thank the Alex Warren of the Morrison Library for his support for this program since its inception. And wish him well, would, uh, is he here today? Unfortunately, he's gone. And wish him well in his retirement. So now, please join me in welcoming Professor Walter Alvarez. Well, thank you, Dean Nolan, for your introduction. And thank you to all of you for coming here to, uh, to enjoy this time together. I should also thank Steve Tollison, who is, I think, largely responsible for putting these together. Well, this is kind of an unusual opportunity for a field geologist to be invited to this very elegant room to talk about the process of writing. And as I was thinking about what to uh, talk with you about today, I kept, I kept thinking about the different kinds of writing and how very different they are. And so I think maybe with uh, Mike Larkin, when we have our conversation, we'll talk a little bit about the whole range from poetry at one extreme to scientific technical writing at the other extreme. But the book that Deb Nolan mentioned, uh, this newest one, Mountains of St. Francis, newest one, it's the second one. Um, this is very much in, this, in the intermediate range of writing about science for people who are not scientists. And uh, I think it's especially hard to do that in the case of geology because not very many people think very often about the history of the Earth. Uh, and, and very few people have taken the time to develop the, uh, the mental skills that you need to do that. And so if you're going to write about geology and Earth history for non-scientists, you've got to figure out some way to trick them into thinking that it's interesting <laughs> until they find out that it really is. And you have to lure them in. And so I thought what I'd do in this case, when I was writing this, was to, was to talk about the experience I've had doing geology in Italy, which of course is a wonderful place. And it's full of fascinating culture, it's full of wonderful history, it's full of delightful people, uh, not to mention some pretty good food. <laughs> and uh, so I thought I could maybe lure people into an interest in geology by first luring them into an interest in, uh, in Italy. So I thought I would read you just a few things. I was asked to do this. Just a few little bits that will give you some idea of the, the flavor of how I'm trying to, to uh, make uh, this story interesting to people. I will leave out most of the technical stuff. You'll have to get lured in yourself to do that. But let me, let me uh, read a few little bits, and, uh, and, and hopefully you'll enjoy them. 
So this is how the book starts. I remember the bitter cold on the day after Christmas in 1970. As Millie and I drove north from Rome into the Apennines, snow lay in patches on the fields, and caps of white crowned the peaks. Beneath gray skies, we emerged from an icy, mountainous tract and entered the wide valley of the upper Tiber River, flanked by frozen hills on either side. Millie and I had only been married five years, but already we had lived in South America, in Holland, and in Libya, for geology is a wonderful path to adventure. <laughs> now we were living in an almost unchanged medieval village north of Rome, and Christmas time offered us the chance to explore a new part of Italy. The road wandered through the frozen valley, and then ahead of us, a much higher mountain came into view, massive, round-topped Monte Subasio, covered with snow dominating the landscape around it. It seemed out of place, like a king among commoners. What kind of history could have produced this huge, isolated mountain? On a shoulder of Monte Subasio, just above the valley floor, stood a little medieval city. From a prominent church high on the left, at the near end of town, the buildings descended to the right in a graceful sweeping curve, punctuated by other smaller churches. The effect was dramatic and elegant. It was our first sight of a season. Millie spent her childhood in Virginia. But I grew up in California, looking across San Francisco Bay toward the city named for St. Francis of Assisi. All my life, I had used the Spanish version of the saint's name, but I knew little about Francis himself. Assisi would give us an opportunity to find out, to join human history with that of the earth. Assisi looked almost deserted. Anyone who could stay inside was keeping warm by a fire. The road climbed up past old stone buildings, gray in the winter light, entered the town, and then opened out into a piazza dominated by the great medieval church we had seen from the valley below. It was the Basilica of San Francesco, the main thing we had come to see. I remember the numbing chill in the completely empty basilica, where Millie and I were all alone for an hour or two as the paintings of Giotto taught us about who St. Francis had been, what he had believed and what he had done. We saw Francis thrusting his rich clothes back at his father, choosing to embrace poverty. We saw him giving his cloak to an impoverished knight. We saw Pope Innocent III dreaming that this devout little beggar, through his hum humility and poverty, might somehow save the Roman Church. Millie found herself wondering how comfortable Francis, il poverello, the little poor man, would have been with a huge, elaborate basilica built to honor his memory. As we wandered through the church and the adjoining cloisters, a geologist like me could not help noticing that the building was constructed of a beautiful limestone. Some blocks were white, some a startling pink color, and many were pink with dramatic streaks of white. Scattered through the limestone were tiny specks that I later learned were microscopic fossils. I could not possibly have imagined that those pink and white rocks exposed in mountainsides and quarries all over this part of Italy would, over the next decade, lead my friends and me to a pair of remarkable discoveries about the history of the Earth. One of those discoveries would allow geologists to date the motions of continents and would thus play a role in the plate tectonic revolution, which was fundamentally altering our understanding of the Earth. The second discovery would overturn the view that all changes in the Earth's past have unfolded slowly and gradually. The most strongly held belief of geologists and paleontologists about the nature of Earth history. I could not then have imagined how well I would come to know those pink and white rocks. <coughs> Finally, we were compelled to leave the church and its frescoes and to seek warmth. Partway across the deserted town, through a stone doorway and down a couple of stairs, we found an unpretentious little trattoria that offered a noontime meal. It was cold in there, too, until the proprietor brought out a bucket of sand with live embers on the top and put it beneath the table. 
In that delightful warmth, we enjoyed a plate of spaghetti. Evening in Assisi at Christmas time was magical. St. Francis is said to have been the originator of the Presepio, or Christmas Crèche. Everywhere in the town there were nativity scenes of every imaginable kind, illuminated by candles or lanterns, and everywhere we could hear the strains of a favorite Italian Christmas carol, Tu scendi dalle stelle, o re del cielo. Down from the stars you come, O king of heaven. And in a little hotel called Albergo Sole, there was a blazing fire on the hearth where an old lady named Pepona was cooking the flatbread called Crescia, which mingled its aroma with that of a delicious sauce for the pasta. It was good to be inside with Millie. Warm firelight illuminating the stone arches of centuries past as the gentle snow fell outside the window. Okay, so hopefully we're getting people lured in just a little bit. So now let me read you, I'm going to read three little bits. This is the second one. This is about a different trip to a season. It was three years after our first trip to Assisi at Christmas time. Millie and I had returned to the city of St. Francis on a geological reconnaissance trip with our friends Bill and Marshall Lowry. Bill, born in Scotland, is a paleomagnetist, a scientist who can read the fossil compasses preserved in rocks. These fossil compasses can tell us where the continents were located on the Earth eons ago and how they were aligned relative to north. We were there to collect samples of Apennine limestones, and we hoped that if we could read the fossil compasses in the rock samples, they would help us to understand how the mountains had come into being so that we could draw accurate maps of Italy in very ancient times. Two days after our first work in the quarries of Assisi, on a darkly overcast and hazy morning in October 1973, Millie and I stood with Bill and Marcia by a balustrade in the little piazza in front of the church of Santa Chiara, just down the street from the Albergo Sole. St. Clair was a young woman of Assisi who was inspired by Francis to found her own order of women following the Franciscan ideals, and her church lies at the other end of the town facing toward the Basilica of St. Francis. The piazza of Santa Chiara offered a view over the flat valley below the town. Down there, among a gathering of small houses, almost indistinguishable in the poor light and the haze, a single dome stood out. It was the Basilica of Santa Maria degli Angeli, a cathedral that honors and protects a tiny church that St. Francis rebuilt with his own hands when he first abandoned his parents to follow his spiritual quest. As we watched, the shifting clouds allowed some rays of sunlight to break through, and a perfect rainbow took form, its end resting precisely on the, on the dome of the basilica. Among the many sights of great beauty we were to see in this fortunate part of Italy, the rainbow at Assisi was one of the most remarkable. But in retrospect, it seems like something more, like an omen a rainbow of promise. It was almost as if St. Francis were saying, welcome to my mountains. Here you will find wonderful things. Indeed, that's how it turned out. So then the book goes on, and it talks about the geology of the city of Rome and how it's built on the deposits of very young volcanoes. And then we go to Siena, and we learn how the very first geologists figured out how to read Earth history written in rocks and dated with fossils. And then we go to Gubbio and we find out about magnetic reversals and about the Cretaceous tertiary impact. And then into the Apennines, and in the sort of the second half of the book, we talk about how mountain ranges come to be, which is a wonderful story and very unfamiliar to most people. And then finally, there's an epilogue, and I'll just read you that, and that will be the end of this reading. August 2004, recent now, was a special moment for the science of geology in Italy. 
Geologists from all over the world were converging on the great Medici castle of Florence for the 32nd International Geological Congress. Though the Congress is a major scientific event held once every four years in different places around the world, it had not met in Italy since the Second Congress in Bologna in 1881. There were talks about geological research from all over the world, but the Congress in Florence was largely a celebration of Italian geology, showcasing the discoveries of the Italian geologists. The progress has been dramatic and unmistakable from the heroic pioneering days of Migliorini, Merla, Signorini, and Trevisan, which I almost overlapped, to the mature scientific world of Italian geology today. It was great to be part of the Congress, hearing exciting lectures, talking to old friends, and meeting a new generation of young Italian geologists. Shortly after the Congress, Millie and I returned to Assisi almost 35 years after our trip of 1970. I was writing this book and wanted to revisit the place where the story had begun. It was the beginning of September, and late summer gave the little city of St. Francis a completely different character. No longer dusted with snow, the streets and piazzas were thronged with people enjoying the pleasant warmth of late afternoon. From the Piazza of Santa Chiara at the south end of town, we looked out over the plain of Santa Maria degli Angeli. Long before, from this spot, we had seen a rainbow touching down on the cathedral that encloses a little church rebuilt by the youthful St. Francis. Just up the street, the hotel we remembered, Albergo Solde, was still there. When we recounted our winter's day so many years earlier, the innkeepers welcomed us as if we were long lost men. We walked through the medieval streets, past the main piazza, and on to the north end of town. Just beyond the city walls lay the great basilica, the majestic, perhaps inappropriate monument to humble Brother Francis, whose life of poverty has so deeply touched so many people. The church was no longer frigid and empty, as on that winter day so long ago. Now it was warm and full of visitors. It was also full of the understanding we had gained over that third of a century. Giotto's frescoes told us the life of a saint, the life of a saint whose story we had come to know well. A road passed out through the town gate, and we walked along the backside of the hill of Assisi until we came to the old quarries that must have been the source of the limestone used to construct the Basilica of St. Francis. Long ago, we had drilled samples of limestone here with Bill Lowry as a part of our paleomagnetic study. We passed a nostalgic half hour talking with Bruno Bodi, the same master stonecutter we had known in 1973, who remembered us working in his court so many years back. Returning, we re-entered the town gate and came once again within sight of the Basilica of St. Francis. Just at that moment, the church was dramatically silhouetted against the brilliant orange setting sun, shining perfectly through the arches of the bell tower. It was a sight that took our breath away, and it seemed wonderfully symbolic. It seemed to bring full circle our long Apennine journey that began at Assisi with a rainbow of promise, falling on a church that marked the beginning of the career of St. Francis. On that long ago morning, when our rainbow fell on Santa Maria degli Angeli, clouds obscured the sun. Now the sky was cloudless, and the sun was clearly visible, entwined with the church that marked the culmination of the life of St. Francis. In those 34 years, the geology of Italy has also gone from obscurity to clarity. In 1970, geologists had neither the local knowledge of Italy nor the general understanding of mountain building to make much sense of the Apennines. Today, geology has advanced from the exhilarating days of the plate tectonic revolution when we first began to sense the outline of a serious understanding of the Earth to a mature science, rich and deep insights into the nature of our planet and its history. During my third of a century of fascination with the mountains of St. Francis, the Italian geologists, 
have come to a deep understanding of the mountains and valleys of their country. What a privilege it has been to contribute to that effort and to help them set in place a few of the stones in that edifice. And what a privilege to join in uncovering the past of our earth high up in the mountains with good friends in a lovely and historic land. Mike Larkin from the college writing program. I feel like a game show host coming in with my <laughs> Yes, right. We're going to have a conversation. Transform the house there, Cook, in this mischief. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for, for coming, and especially you, Walter. Um, I wanted to start with uh, T Rex and the Crater of Doom, and kind of spoke out from there. Uh, that was the first of your. your piece of writing that I read, and I had sort of initial concerns when Steve asked me last summer to interview you. I immediately said yes, but I thought, well, I don't know much about geology. You know, what I don't know can fill a crater, so to speak. But, um, uh, but then I picked up the book, and in the epigraph to the first chapter, you have um, an excerpt from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings with a reference to Mount Doom, uh, bringing an end to Middle Earth as we knew it then. And then the discussions of Middle Earth kind of run through that first chapter. And so my first question for you was sort of why the choice to include Tolkien's world as sort of one of the invocations of the discussion you had in that book about your discovery of the impact and the Iridium wave and so forth. Well, you told me once, Mike, that you have long loved the Lord of the Rings. And I didn't discover it until about 10 years ago, I guess. I know, somehow I missed it. And I- so, Sorry, can you hear this not the mic? Like on? Is it on that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Doesn't sound like a pickup. So. How's that? Can you hear? It's a little bit. Wow. Did I turn this? Oh, it's so on that. There we go. Good. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't discover Lord of the Rings until I was uh, until I was uh, well along in years, and I fell in love with it. And it was just about the time that I was starting to write uh, uh, T. Rex and the Crater of Doom, and I kept finding I was sort of reading Tolkien while I was writing that book, and I kept mm -hmm. finding passages that seemed absolutely appropriate. And so, actually, an early draft of the book had a Tolkien quote at the beginning of every single chapter. <laughs> this is what editors are for. <laughs> that got scrubbed out of there, and it was a really good thing. But I thought that the opening quote was just so appropriate to what was going on. I don't know how Tolkien knew so far ahead of time. Yeah, so the yeah. fictional yeah. evocation of the, yeah. the transformation of the world. Kind of, okay. um, yeah, I, I loved it as one who you know, read it when he was young, and named his first dog Proto. It spoke, <laughs> spoke to me. So, um, and with the book, uh, there are obviously you and your colleagues from the first paper you wrote about the iridium layer uh, and on through really all the 80s and into the early 90s were publishing steadily and other people looking at other issues there and challenging it. Um, so you were doing a lot of publishing in scientific literature, but and it's a great story. Uh, but what moved you or at what point did you decide, okay, time to write it a book about this for a non-scientific, non-geologist audience. Um, well, I think that maybe this is something that quite a few ge uh, scientists come to at some point in their career. They think, gee, I've been doing this really interesting work and I've only been talking about it in technical language. And maybe, maybe there are people who would, would be interested in, in hearing about this. I, here's a funny thing about, about scientists. Um, I don't know how many of you have read much technical scientific writing, but at first it seemed really dreary. It, uh, it's, it's highly technical, it's utterly devoid of emotion. Um, it's usually full of jargon, and it's quite impenetrable. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are in the business and have learned that particular jargon and know that language, we love it. <laughs> but uh, most people don't. I, at one time it, it crossed my mind that, that as, as scientists we live this, this life of, of, of fabulous intellectual excitement and adventure. 
and the price is that we write like accountants. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you sort of have to because, you know, the, the point of science is not like creative writing where you can write anything you want to. The point is that you've got to get it exactly right. You, you have to get the, you, you want to find out the way nature really works or what has really happened in the past. And if you let your druthers influence you at all, if, if, if you allow your emotions to interfere with what you're finding out, you're going to get the wrong answer. And that's why we scrub the emotion out of it. And yet, if you, you, know, if you spend an evening drinking beer with geologists, <laughs> you'll, you'll find out that we are emotional about what we do because it's so exciting. But in order to do it right, you can't let the emotion interfere with what you're finding out. And that's why we write like it happens. And I think it seems to me that many geologists or many scientists, and, 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 and I'm one, came to come to feel that now it's time to write something in a way that the, that my mother can understand or my friends can understand. So that's what they need to do. And, and you think on, on balance that you do a pretty good job of keeping the emotion out of the technical writing? Well, I'll tell you this, if I don't, the reviewers for the journal will get it out of there. Yeah, it won't survive. Well, uh, I like that you um, <coughs> reference sort of that, you know, obviously, your human beings do you have emotions, and it, it seems to be a... Um, uh, it's a motivating factor and part, part of what you do. Uh, and I guess given what I gather was rather heated debate during that roughly 10, 11 year period between the time of your announcement of the uh, the finding of the iridium layer and the crater being found off the coast of Mexico. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, in terms of, given the obviously emotional nature of some of what was driving some of that for some people, did that, even though you're writing T-Rex for a non-scientist, non-specialist audience, do you think it affected, knowing that that debate had taken place and it had sort of been died down, did that affect the tone of the book, do you think, at all, in terms of how you, how you wrote it? And I'll you, tell you something like that. There were some pretty, am I on now? We're sort of going back and forth here. Right? So, uh, it's my turn now. Yes. <laughs> well, turn me down. Yeah, there were some pretty heated uh, discussions and debates and meetings during the 1980s after the proposal that the dinosaurs had been, uh, uh, had died out because of impact, or that there had even been a massive impact at all, because uh, geologists and paleontologists for, um, 150 years were accustomed to thinking that all changes in the Earth's past have been slow and gradual. So um, those of us who were who were starting to find evidence for for a, a huge impact you know, ran into conflict with this tradition that everything had been slow and gradual. You know, some people were open to new ideas, and some people had seen lots of evidence for slow and gradual things, and there was a lot of pretty intense debate. In fact, there were some meetings that were uh, were quite wild. Mm -hmm. And yet the thing is, and this is one thing that I love about science, is that you know that eventually it's going to be decided on the basis of the facts, of the evidence. And even at a meeting where people are really getting angry with each other, it's on the basis of the facts that this group knows and the facts that this group knows. And so we all know that eventually we're going to agree on what the answer is. Most of us, almost all. <laughs> and it's going to be based on, on, on the evidence. And, and that's one thing I love about science. You know, you don't find that in politics. <laughs> How often do you find somebody who has one extreme political view or another changing their mind on the basis of the facts that are, are, are or discovered doesn't happen very often, but it happens all the time in geo and not just geology, but all the sciences. So, so in writing the book, you know, I don't know, quite frankly, I I was tired of that dispute. You know, we all of us involved have been through it to the point where we didn't want to talk about it anymore. So I thought it was best to leave that out of the book. Yeah, because it's sort of hinted at there, and then looking at some other sources and outside sources, yeah. uh, and a couple of your writings from. In, in the technical journals from the period that it comes through some of the that heated nature of the debate. And you know. but you try to keep it out of the yeah. literature as much as you can because mm -hmm. the literature is meant to be dispassionate. Some of the discussions at meetings are not exactly dispassionate. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. 
as you alluded to in, the, in T. Rex there. Well, there was one book that a colleague of mine brought to my attention, Pat Steenland, she's here somewhere, I think, uh, which she said you had to, I wasn't familiar with until Monday. It's a novel called Three Times Table by a British writer named Sarah Maitland. And um, one of the characters uh, in the novel is a paleontologist near the end of her career, and she's kind of made her name on a dinosaur she discovered and named and put together from the late Cretaceous period. And the novel came out in 1990, and um, there's a uh, scene in here, a number of them, but where she's uh, giving some of her reactions to the discovery of the impact theory, and just wanted to sort of read, read it, because it struck me that the whole sense of the emotion, emotional as well as intellectual investment behind uh, uh, scientific work for, for people such as yourself. So this internal monologue, she had resisted the leaps and their inevitable consequence, catastrophes theory. Not a steady, careful emergence, the delicate overlapping of species, the subtle interconnection of environment, climate, food chains, mutations, adaptations, and survivals, but a cosmic crash, accidental, inexplicable, random chance smashing into the patterns, distorting and restructuring them. Big bang thinking, not just for cosmologists and pacifists, but for nice orderly evolutionists as well. Catastrophe theory, not proven, but increasingly accepted all those brash Americans and their bounding energy. So <laughs> I guess you be the brash Americans with bounding energy. Um, but that, that, you've spoken to it already some, but that sort of distinction of sort of defining, I guess, of what might be called reason or intellect versus the emotion. Um, and actually, there was an assignment that you described to me last week that I'd like to tell people about. You have your, um, I think it was your strategy students do, where you have them write a letter to a non-geologist about <coughs> sites they visited. I think you said you went to Utah and field work and also the Calicut Tunnel. Uh, if you could just describe the assignment, what the students do and, and why they do it. Uh, okay, this is, um, this is a stratigraphy class I'm teaching. I see a couple of my students who are here that uh, I'm, I'm glad of. But um, as professors, we're always assigning term papers or research papers, and, and usually we expect them to be written in the technical language that we know well. And, and it seemed to me that maybe it would be useful for people to start learning early on how to explain things to people who are not, uh, not scientists. And so um, the people in my class have been, they've done two now, writing to their little sister or their aunt or somebody like that, or a friend or a roommate, about something they've been learning in this class and trying to get this person, little sister, excited about it. And it's been really fun reading those, uh, those papers and seeing how they're doing this. Maybe it's a, maybe, maybe people who write this kind of T-Rex book will come out of that class in the future. Yeah, well then, and how do you see that maybe speaking to the way that they might turn around and approach the technical or academic record? Does it have application there, do you think? Well, I'm not sure because I think the two ways of writing are so very different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, science students at a university like this get lots of training in, in how to write technical stuff. You know, if you write a bachelor's thesis or a PhD thesis, and your thesis supervisor will lean over you, right, Brian? Okay. Lean over you and, uh, and will not accept the thing until it's written in the style that scientists use to write this stuff. So people come out of college or especially out of graduate school really knowing how to do the technical writing, but maybe not having had much practice in, in, in telling interesting stories to people who are not scientists. I suspect they like doing that, the latter. I hope so. Okay. Yeah. I hope so. Okay. I'll, I'll ask them tomorrow. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I want to sort of get into some of the nuts and bolts of you know, your technique as a writer. Um, I guess sort of starting with uh, what, what usually prompts you to start writing? Is it sort of a case of, well, I had a question, I collected some data, now it's time to sit down and start writing my findings? Or are there other prompts and problems? Well, yes, yeah, sometimes, sometimes writing a scientific paper is the way you report on the, on the research that you have done. But sometimes writing the technical papers you find out is the way you find out whether you understand it or not. Because uh, my experience is that when you, when you set out to write a technical paper, you very quickly find out the things that you hadn't thought about yet. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then your friend in the next office or your graduate student or the reviewer for the journal 
will point out very clearly to you what you didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And so it's a it's it's part of the research process, not just the reporting process. Yeah, because that was going to be a question I have for you is how often writing is an act of thinking for you, writing is an act of discovery. And it sounds like that is the case. You know, well, then right now I'm 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 thinking about something that's that's pretty pretty far out in left field, and I don't know whether it's uh, has even the hope of becoming a useful set of ideas or not. So I thought, well, the best thing to do is to start writing about it. So I started doing that. We'll find out pretty soon whether there's anything there or not. And this is big history, you're That's big okay, which I want to get into. Uh, there's a great article, in case I don't get a chance to mention it later, uh, in California Monthly, the Cal Alumni Magazine, for those of you who are alums. And if not, you can get it online. Uh, that partly talks about this, as well as it being a central subject in St. Francis. Um, I wonder too about uh, how you write. Do you have particular habits or places, or times, or things you need to do to get in a writing frame of mind? It's a little bit hit or miss, you know, when you can find time to do it. When I was writing T. Rex and the Crater of Doom, I sort of uh, I found quite a number of mornings where I could inhabit a little little restaurant up in Kensington. Do any of you know in Kensington? So I uh, wrote a lot of the book there, consuming vast amounts of coffee. And two things came out of that. One was the book, and the other thing was the discovery that I like coffee better than it liked me. <laughs> <laughs> can't use that technique anymore. <laughs> Otherwise, at times, it's a fight for every sentence. And one thing that I find is I do an awful lot of revising. I, I keep going over it again and again and again. And, if I, and I'm not happy, I guess, until I really like what I'm reading. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I find is that sometimes I'll read something I've written and I think, gosh, that's dull. I don't like that at all. You know, and, and I'll go back and I'll try and fix it, and sometimes I can't fix it. And eventually, I just come to the conclusion that I don't like what I've written. And I don't even have the right idea yet. I don't even have the right concept. So sometimes I'll just throw out a whole big chunk of stuff because I, I figure if I don't find it interesting, <laughs> I can't imagine the readers are going to. And, and so uh, that's to me a signal that I don't yet have the right plan or the right through line or the right concept. Mm -hmm. So it sort of speaks to whether the audience will be engaged by yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at the point where you are happy with what you're saying, say others will like this or the argument is solid, um, and you feel it's ready for somebody else to see, uh, what do you do in terms of feedback? Who do you show it to? Uh, does it depend on what it is? Well, I had a very good editor. Uh, at, he was at Princeton for the first book, and at Norton for the second book, a guy named Jack Repchak. And uh, I send it to him, and uh, he gives me his thoughts about it. And sometimes I'll show it to friends and show it to millions. Not in any very organized kind of way. Okay. Depending on what it is. And what's. You know, there, there, were, there were two or three things since we started talking about mm -hmm. the, um, the the mechanics of it. There were there were two or three things that I thought might be kind of interesting. I sort of gradually learned they're in here someplace. Where are they? Um, um, one thing is that um, I'm I find myself being really picky about grammar. And um, so I, I trust there are not any split infinitives in, in that book. And that's not because I particularly care about split infinitives. And I'm aware that language is evolved and our language is evolving. But the reason is that um, whenever I'm reading somebody else's book, well, so I, I grew up with strict grammar teachers you know, and uh, sort of Victorian background, I think. And they would not let me get away with the split infinitive. So what that means is anytime I'm reading somebody else's <laughs> writing and I see a split infinitive, the old alarm goes off in the back of my mind and says split infinitive. Right? And when that happens, it distracts me from what the, what the writer is trying to say. So I, I scrub those split infinitives out of there, not because I don't because I care about split infinitives, but it, it's because I care about keeping the reader's attention on what the, the, the point is rather than on the grammar. So another thing like that, maybe you notice that there's um, uh, you know, nowadays it's um, 
you know, you don't you don't want to write uh, about he this and, uh, and and never say she. Mm -hmm. That's and so people talk about writing gender neutral language, right? And so often you'll see he or she. If I see someplace he or she, my little alarm goes off. It says gender gender neutral language, and it distracts me from what else is being said. And so, um, so I scrub that out of there. If there's some place where there's a he, but which could have been a she, I just rewrite the sentence completely so that that pronoun disappears because I don't want people being distracted by that, by that kind of detail. Mm -hmm. that kind of and it is the case of that sort of distraction, or is it also uh, bearing on meaning in terms of folks in the grammar? Well, I think you can probably say the same thing in a variety of different <coughs> ways. Mm -hmm. And you could either, either say it with he or she, or you can say it in a way that has no pronoun in, what, in, in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And they'll mean exactly the same thing, and one will be distracting the other one. Mm -hmm. And there was one other thing that I, I sometimes talk about with, with my students that I, I, I wanted to mention while we're here, and that is if you're writing for a, a, an audience that has a wide range of, of backgrounds, then you run into the problem that some of your readers know jargon and some people don't. And so what do you do about definitions? So if I'm writing uh, something about geology, I use the word anticline. Uh, if I don't put a definition in it, the people who are not geologists have any idea what I'm talking about. And if I do put a definition in, the geologists say, I know that. <laughs> and so uh, I find there's a neat way to solve that problem is with, is with what I, I like to think of as a built-in definition. And so I would say something like, uh, this range of the Apennine Mountains is a giant anti this kind of an upfold of strata, the such and such. So that in other words, you use, first of all, you use the word, and then you, you, you define it without defining it. You just put in a phrase that says what that word means. And that way, hopefully, nobody's either insulted or not. Right. <laughs> keep the geologist happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. keep everybody happy. Yeah. Sign that. Well, in, in that vein of jargon, there was a piece I was very glad that I, I saw and came across, the, which had the very tantalizing title of The Gentle Art of Scientific Trespassing, a couple of quote, pull quotes from which are in your program. Uh, and you talk in there about, it's clear not only from that essay, which I had to physically go get in the library of the cone, which is so much more satisfying than the electronic database that's great as are. Um, uh, you talk in there about the importance of interdisciplinary work and the importance of learning to speak others' dialects and in other disciplines to be able to, uh, uh, to work together. And I thought you made a useful distinction uh, between the, the virtues of jargon, or maybe the necessity of jargon, versus you know, the more pejorative things you think of. And I wonder if you could speak to that. There's also a piece I think you had photocopied that I had yeah. pulled as well. I wanted if you could attempt to read uh, yeah, just the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, actually, Mike and I talked about this once before, so I think we were, we were both thinking about it. But Maybe this would be a good time to think about the, the range of writing from poetry at one end to um, to, um, to, to, to technical language at mm -hmm. the other end. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought I'd just, uh, I'd like to think with you for a moment about what these different kinds of writing are like. So think about poetry. I just always loved poetry. And um, maybe in part because it is vague, you usually in many kind, many many uh, pieces of poetry, I find it very hard to figure out what what the poet meant. And in fact, who is it who wrote a poem should not mean that he who was somebody knows who that is. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a line from a poem. But um, the few people in the audience who know, I'm, I'm sure there are people who know. But um, just listen to this one for a moment. This is uh, this is uh, this is a bit of uh, of Kubla Khan from from Kohler. It's just Listen to this and think about what it does to you emotionally. And if you can, at the same time, think about what the meaning of this is. So it says, a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played singing of Mount Tabor. 
But I revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight would win me that with music loud and long I would fill that dome there, that sunny dome, those caves of ice. And all who heard should see them there. And all should say, beware, beware his floating eye, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. Weave a circle round him thrice and close your eyes with holy dread. For he on honeydew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise. I think we need to get more. Okay, so here's the point about that. First of all, it has a strong emotional contact, content. The second thing is that with the single exception of Agora, which is probably a mountain someplace, every single word in that passage is quite familiar to us. We know exactly what that word means. I don't know about you, I can't figure out what the poem means. <laughs> I'm not even sure that Coleridge could have had it. it had, there had been wonderful study done in which they found where everything that Coleridge had been reading, and they found where he got each of those bits of, 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 of um, material I guess before he went into a kind of an opium fuel dream or something like that. But I'm not sure that it means anything. You can't figure out what it means. Okay, now let's go to the other extreme and go to this technical piece that uh, that Mike was mentioning. So listen to this. This is this is um, uh, I hope you like this. <laughs> Dissimulatory anoxic oxidation is carried out in the sulfuretum by photolithotrophic bacteria like the chlorobiacea, which are obligate photolithoautotrophs and strict anaerobes, the chromatiaceae, which are partly obligate, partly facultative photolithotrophs, and the rhodospirulaceae, which are photoheterotrophs, although many of them are able to grow photolithotrophically as well. <laughs> okay, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> the from a little bit. <laughs> yeah, okay, so let's think about that one for a second. So, just as in the case of Coleridge, probably nobody in this room knows what that means, including me. And the reason here is that we don't know those words. We haven't learned that language. Now, I have a colleague over in, in our department over there, Jill Banfield, who's the a specialist in, um, in microbial uh, aspects of, of geological processes. And Jill would know exactly what that means. It might even have a certain austere beauty to her because it represents a lot of careful observations about nature and tied together in a way that would be interesting to her. It was written maybe 20 years ago. She probably even knows what's different now about, uh, about what people understand. So here's something which is equally incomprehensible, for, but for a totally different reason. And I think in the, in the uh, piece that you mentioned, Mike, I was a little bit making fun of that. Mm -hmm. But I think I have a, a, more, um, a more generous um, take on it now. Because it is written to be exceedingly precise and exceedingly economic in use of words. And it conveys an extremely clear meaning between one person and another who happened to have learned that language. And so these are the kind of the two extremes. And to my mind, the, the, this kind of writing that, that I was doing in these two books and that so many other scientists are doing in, in fascinating books for the general public, I'm trying to find a, a medium, a happy medium somewhere between those. Well, and you, and you were, some degree in the article making fun of that passage yeah. and, and uh, the passage Orwell would love to had yeah. access to for politics and the English language. Um, but but you did talk about the virtues of jargon in that article and say it was sort of a necessary thing to be able to speak uh, to each other. Um, in a similar vein, I guess, of translation and speaking to different audiences, one thing that struck me throughout the T-Rex and then again in St. Francis where you actually more directly addressed it with the uh, exclamation points. Um, which I wasn't used to seeing um, uh, as much, except in lines of dialogue, sort of 
keep making exclamations, uh, but you've used them in a number of places throughout the books, and, and I gathered what your purpose was, and then I think I was, it was made clear to me that I was right based on your discussion of it later, but I just wondered if you could uh, mention why, why the exclamation points in the books, because a search of your scientific literature, not exhaustive, but reveals no anomalous exclamation points in the scientific <laughs> literature, so what's that about? Well, I had no idea. I had no idea I was using exclamation points. I think maybe my editor might have let me down, or maybe, maybe they have, I'm not sure. Um, I guess I tend to be an enthusiastic and maybe excitable person, so maybe they, uh, maybe they were coming out there, but you know, I didn't know I was doing Well, it's, it struck me when you, the moments when you're using it, it's expressing excitement and like, this is a big deal, and, but you sort of leave it unstated, uh, except there's a couple spots in here, uh, just as one example. Um, where you'll trans almost translate the passage, uh, uh, talking about the first sandstone, sandstone bed in the mountains of St. Francis, and said, uh, the second change brought something completely new to the mountains of St. Francis. The first sandstone bed. Let me explain why an apparently innocuous sentence like that needs an exclamation point. This is literally the first sandstone bed, you know, so, and it's another one later where you write a sentence, um, with a period, and then the very next sentence you write it again with an exclamation point, translating the first is the way a non-geologist would see this piece of rock, and the second is the way a geologist did. So it did seem there was sort of a language of punctuation there functioning. Yeah, you were pointing that out. I was. <laughs> no, no, I now remember that bit. Look through, yeah. look through, and see if you've got it elsewhere. Uh -huh. um, uh, let's see a couple different ways I want to go here. Well, look, look before we sort of run out of time and leave time for questioning from the audience, I wanted to get to uh, the Mounts of St. Francis in terms of the decision to write that book, because T-Rex, uh, that story of that discovery and the debate and then it, it sort of coming to be accepted, had an obvious kind of narrative arc and sort of a compelling story to tell. Um, and this one, what was the decision there? Is it tied up with the notion of big history and exploring those ideas? Or? No. I had been thinking about this book with that specific title since about, since the late 1970s, I guess. Because I was, I had been focused for so long on Italy and on understanding this wonderful mountain range. And uh, why St. Francis? Well, you know, I guess many people are interested in St. Francis as a religious figure and other people are interested in, in him as a, as a historical figure. So he just, his legacy just dominates this part of Italy. You can't go anywhere in this part of Italy without running into the, uh, the uh, effects of St. Francis. And so I started thinking about the Apennine. Nobody else calls it the mountains of St. Francis. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wanted to write this book beginning in the late 70s. And I tried once or twice. And I realized when I did that well, I didn't understand those mountains. And, uh, and, and so as the years have gone on, largely through the efforts of the Italian geologists who have worked so hard on doing that, I'm a little part in it, but mostly it's their work. We've gotten to the point where we could tell the story of these mountains in a comprehensive way. Of course, the story is told in all sorts of technical articles. But uh, the matter of time is kind of interesting. I had a fight for that title. The, the people at Norton did not want that title on it. They wanted it to be um, a journey into deep time, or something like that. Yeah. You know, that's sort of an evocative title, but that could be the, that could be the title of any book about geology. <laughs> and uh, and so we had a we had a kind of a go round with uh, with Norton about that, and, and I said, you know, that this book only exists because that title has been in my mind for thirty years. <laughs> and uh, finally, I won out, and now I think they. Maybe they might be thinking, well, maybe that's why it's not selling as well as your <laughs> 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 <Pure> marketing. <laughs> but I guess I was thinking in terms of, of the the idea uh, behind it that, that drove your decision to say, I want to write a book for again for the non scientists to read. Uh, and, and one of the things that answered for me, which T Rex did too, but this one especially, was well, isn't that convenient for Walter? He gets to do all his field work in Italy. <laughs> um, but it, it sort of addresses that, or implicitly. Well, you know, over the years, Mike, I've had to develop a lot of standard answers to people who say, 
boy, that must be tough doing all that field work in Italy. And I've got a whole list of them, which I could rehearse right now, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there, there were a number of favorite moments in both the books, and there were a couple, I guess, in light of where we're sitting now, one of which I pulled for the program about the emotional experience of finding a new quarry being akin to entering the doors of the library. Um, and, and I also love the other the related part in T-Rex where you were needing to find another incidence of iridium in the KT layer elsewhere in the world other than that in Italy at Gubbio. And um, so instead of going out with your pickaxe to some site around the world, he says, so I went to the library to hunt for another KT site. And I just love that, you know, to be able to go to the library to find Geological. Well, we, we, have a wonderful, <coughs> we have a wonderful earth science library over there. I don't know if Brian is still here. Brian is still there. He's our librarian. I'm so indebted to the librarians for making our research. Well, oh, let me tell you a wonderful thing that Rich Muller said. Maybe some of you have had visits for future president. But, uh, Rich Muller was talking about how you ought to go and find out what's been done. But he said sometimes three years in the laboratory will save you an afternoon in the library. <laughs> <laughs> but not so much an emotional connection to the library. But let, me just, let me just say something about the, uh, this being the Berkeley Library. One thing, I don't know if you noticed it as you went through there, but there's a lot of mentions of Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And what I find is when I read books by other academics, they sort of filter out where they are. You know, it becomes difficult, other than reading the back and seeing where they're a professor. You can't tell from the book where they're from. Well, I love this campus and this university so much. I just wanted to bring it in. I don't know whether that turns people off, but if it does, heck with them. I just wanted to bring it in. It came through. Yeah. It did. Yeah. Um, well, before we turn it over to questions from the audience, I just wanted to uh, maybe in some ways wrap up with thinking about um, some of what we writers, writing teachers, some and say to our students, kind of having that so what moment of the significance of, of why you're writing, which virtually yeah. every writer has to do it, academic, uh, literature, otherwise. And there, there was one spot, which was one of the kind of, I guess, so what moments for the, the non-geologist audience um, uh, that I wanted to have you read, to sort of box the, the paragraph there. And then maybe to talk a little bit about how you sort of encapsulate the, the reasons for doing this, for understanding big history, so to speak, for a non-geologist audience. Okay, this little paragraph, I think, is relevant to something that I've been talking a lot about with my students in, in the big history class, which is a, a, a cross-listed <coughs> between earth and planetary science and letters of science. And we've been talking a lot about, um, about the role of contingencies, which are unpredictable events, and, and how, how very dependent the world we live in now is on all of the uh, remarkable things that have happened in the past that have been very hard to predict in advance. And so this kind of ties into that, I guess. It's, I, I had talked about an ge uh, um, Italian geologist named Giovanni Merla, who had figured out that there were a whole bunch of these anticlines, that's this uphold, <laughs> that had we know that. <laughs> I you were paying attention to I filled in the definition, right? Okay. So this passage says, the Italian peninsula exists because of Giovanni Merla's ridges. If they had never formed, all this part of Italy would still lie submerged below sea level. Human history would have been folded in, unfolded in an entirely different way. With no Rome, no Roman Empire, no Gothic War, no Roman Catholic Church, no St. Francis, no Florentine Renaissance, no Tuscany for Nicholas Steno to invent geology in, and a greatly impoverished human treasure of art and literature, music, and science. Our civilizations are built on the landscape that geological history has been studied. Yeah, yeah just, I mean, that was one of those moments in the book, and there's a number of them. Uh, the difficulties of crossing the Alps and how that affected history, or the, the route of the Tiber River and how that affected Rome eventually being comparable by Constantine and so forth. And just sort of that framed it really wonderfully for sort of non-scientist reader. Um, I want to open it up to the audience to ask any questions you've got. We've got about 15 minutes or so, so I can monopolize them further, but that's, that's Brian. Okay, Brian, I can speak loudly when you ask. Sure, sure. Uh, 
considering your background, what facets of historical knowledge do you think one could use to excite the non-specialist about geology and big history? If you were to pick, pick the best, best things that could be done. Did you all hear that? So no. the, que the question was, what aspects <coughs> could Walter draw on to excite non-geologists about big history and and, and geology, and geology yeah. generally. Um, if, if, you're, if you were to pick the best things that you think would do the best job of exciting people, what would this be? Well, I don't know. Um, little kids love dinosaurs, so uh, that's always that's always a winner. And uh, and uh, children especially seem to like great violent catastrophes. So <laughs> that always helps. But I think sometimes you can you can. Trying to think as I go along about this, sometimes you can find, uh, I imagine you could find slow, gradual processes that have gradually led to the, the earth we live on. I, I know a good one. In fact, I was just talking about that with my uh, stratigraphy class uh, last week. And that is, in, in continental drift, you probably all know that we can move all of the continents back and you can we find that they were once assembled into a, a supercontinent that, that geologists call Pangaea. And it's now in the process of breaking up and the pieces are dispersing around. Well, um, it isn't just that that was what there was and now it's dispersing, but there's been a whole cycle. So before Pangaea, there was a supercontinent called Rodinia. And it dispersed and the pieces moved around and they came together to form Pangaea. Did I say that right? Originally it was Rodinia, and the pieces dispersed around, they came to form Pangaea. Now they're dispersing around, and there's been this long, slow, gradual supercontinent cycle. It's, it's a little bit like opening and closing an accordion, only the motions are more random. And here's the sort of cool thing that you can, you can find out about that. So, um, when um, when Gondwana land, which became part of Pangaea, when Gondwana land was first assembled, it was upside down. So these fingers point north, and that's the way Gondwana land is now. That's Africa and South America and Australia. They were facing south. Gondwana was upside down. And so you think, well, did it twist like that? No, it didn't. Actually, what it did was it went around under the South Pole and came up the other side, <laughs> with North facing this way. But there was glacial glaciers at the South Pole during part of that track. And so what you can see, now I'll just do it with one hand, as you come across here, there's a whole track of, of glacial deposits that mark the passage of Gondwana on one side going around and inverting on the other. I don't know, maybe that would interest me. Well, I want to point out too, just what you just yeah. did both visually yeah. and uh, with language with sort of an analogy and metaphor there is present in both books in terms of, and you do that really well, as I recommend reading both books, they're wonderful, but that's something that comes through. Right? Um, other questions? Along the, the lines of audience, as a non-scientific reader, um, when you're writing for a general audience, do you have someone in mind, say your little sister, your aunt, as you give that assignment in your class, do you have a person or a group of people in mind? It's easy to, I, I imagine, to imagine your scientific audience when you're writing your scientific pieces, but for the general uh, pieces, who's your audience? In this particular case, I have a friend who uh, is retired from Intel. He's an engineer and very broadly interested in all sorts of things, uh, a guy named Rick Daniel. And uh, he actually convinced me to write this book. And I, I wasn't sure I wanted to take the, the, the time and, and, and effort it would take to write this book. And he convinced me. And he was always there to read a section. So I think I was largely writing it for Rick Day. Do I see him in the dedication page? Uh, probably did, yeah, at the very beginning of the dedication page. Yeah. Steve? 
he's a ringer, so. <laughs> so, what, what do you like to read? And I don't mean your favorite theological journal. I mean, what, you know, what kinds of reading do you do for, for fun, relaxation, enjoyment? Well, I, uh, Okay, confession is in order. I I I I, uh, I watched the the video of Bonnie Wade when she did this uh, two or three years ago, and and she said what she likes to read is is uh, historical fiction and mystery stories. And I'm right now in the process of reading through the Brother Cadful mysteries, and I love them for the. Uh, I, I don't normally read mystery stories. In this case, I love them because, first of all, they're they're set in medieval times, and so you learn a very great deal about the 12th century. But also, uh, they're I don't know how you tell a murder mystery and, and end up with you feeling really good about the people. In the book. <laughs> somehow, it, uh, that, that's what I'm doing right now. A lot, a lot of history and a lot of historical fiction. Your favorite favorite authors of all time. There was a couple of wonderful books about uh, Theseus in Greek. Who, who was it who wrote The King Must Die and uh, Go Home See Her? Mary Renault. Mary Renault. I mean, those, might, those might be, they'd be right up there. Yeah. With that set up the confession time, I thought you were going to say vampire romances or something. <laughs> 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 nope. Back there, yeah. It seems that everybody's attention, everybody's collective attention span is getting shorter in terms of science, history, and literature. I, I, I'm not quite here. Since, oh, it seems, since it seems that people's attention spans are getting shorter in terms of science, history, and literature, and mathematics, uh, do you think that in terms of marketing a book like this, I, I, I think it's a great title, do you think in marketing a book like this, do you think that people buy what they know or what they get excited about? Oh, 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 what I think is creative or fun, like like the Harry Potter books. I mean, that came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden she went from books to, to movies, and she's you know big because people that was brand new to a lot of people. The whole the whole witch thing was a big it was brand new as opposed to something that people knew. So the question is, sort of, given people sort of short attention spans yes, and variety yes. of fields, um, how much does that affect sort of yes. what they might choose to read? Yes. So we were talking about how the book was selling relative to Harry Potter. <laughs> it's not doing it well. <laughs> you need to do a whole series. And, uh, also, my understanding from talking to uh, to to uh, my publisher Jack Repcheck is that that in the present economic uh, circumstances, that books just aren't doing as well as they were previously. But uh, let me pick up on your first comment about uh, about attention spans. And um, there's something that that seriously worries me is what, uh, what the internet is doing to libraries. And um, I confess that when I want to learn about something new, the first thing I do is I go to Wikipedia. But I don't stop there. You know, I look in Wikipedia for some interesting uh, books, and then I go to the library. And, uh, and what I'm finding now is that my students who are freshmen and sophomores don't have the habit of going to the library to look for books. It's almost as if if it doesn't exist on the web, it doesn't exist. And so I've been assigning them, you go to the library and you bring back a book. I don't care what it is, bring it back and give me the reference and read enough of it to be able to say something interesting about it. I, I'm really very worried about that. Mm -hmm. I find when I get worried about that and I ask my students about it and talk to them about what they're reading, they actually give me more hope than that they turned out they're reading books and they appreciate getting the physical text as opposed to trying to scan it on the screen. Uh, we have time for maybe one more question. Here. Uh, you spoke repeatedly of rainbows. It seems a little strange for a geologist, but uh, I presume that you as a geologist would know that it was God's promise not to destroy the earth again like it did with the flood. Uh, are you familiar with that quote? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Well, I thought you were going to bring it up in the You know, I, I was trying to walk a delicate line in this book because um, when, when you're a scientist, it's not seemly to talk a lot about religious matters because is, the culture doesn't, uh, is different. And yet, here I'm writing a book that's got St. Francis in the title, and it's in a part of the 
a world where where St. Francis and, and, and basically the history of the Roman Catholic Church is everywhere. And so uh, I was trying to bring that in in a way that uh, respected the history of the area without making any particular personal statement about religious matters. I, I hope I got away with it. <laughs> I like it. How much hope do you think that there is a bridging that, that gap that you talked about? You talked about a little bit earlier and then you mentioned it in the California Monthly article about the way scientists can have their their worldview shifted by the evidence and sort of se uh, severe <laughs> testing and theory versus a political, religious, ideological position. How hopeful are you that on whatever spectrum we're on that we can sort of shift our views when it's necessary? I, I, I don't know. I, I tend to be by nature optimistic. I'm not entirely optimistic in this case. And I think science is really a very unusual human activity in the way it does base itself on what the, what the evidence is. And I don't know. We're, we're going to see, I guess. Certainly my colleagues in paleontology, Jerry and Brian over here, are, are exposed to the, the the conflicts between some aspects of religion and some aspects of science more than I am. So Kevin Padian, who by the way used to be the director of the college writing program, spends quite a bit of his research time um, rebutting claims of uh, young earth creationists, <laughs> including the Dover trial. Including the Dover trial. So I, so I guess I had enough. Uh, I had enough. Um, Conflict over the, the the impact theory early on. That I'm not interested in getting somebody else. <laughs> <Okay. to do laughs> well, thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate it.